Let's hear the word of God. A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now, his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost. This is the third parable <clears throat> that Jesus told in Luke 15 in response to the religious leaders who came to Jesus and criticized him for hanging out with the wrong kind of people, for hanging out with people who weren't followers of God, who paid no attention to God's Word, and who lived their lives in a very godless way. Yet Jesus interacted with these folks so that they could hear the truth about him and who God was and the religious leaders criticized him and challenged him as being illegitimate because of that. Jesus told three stories about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and now the lost son to illustrate God's perspective on his life and his interaction with people who were far from God. Let's look a little bit closer at this parable. We see in this parable that obviously the Father represents God the Father, 
The oldest son, I would submit to you, could represent easily the church. It could represent people in the church today. And the youngest son represents people outside the church, people that are unreached. Let's look again at what the parable says. Beginning in verse 11, it says, He also said a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. The idea is this, that the younger son was wanting his inheritance before his father died. His father granted that, and instead of using it for purposes his father would have desired, he spent it on himself in sinful behavior. You know, God has wonderful blessings, a great inheritance. You know, the Bible talks about salvation in Jesus Christ as an inheritance. We are the heirs of God in Christ he makes a covenant with us, and that word covenant can also be translated testament, as in a last will and testament, and he gives us an inheritance. God has a wonderful plan, a permanent inheritance that lasts, begins now, and lasts forever. And he has great blessings for our life, but they're to be used in his time and in his way, not in our time and our way. But... Like the father in the parable, if we choose to squander the inheritance and ignore what God wants to give us, God will honor our choice to disobey Him. God will let you decide to turn your back on Him and walk away. You can choose to disobey and squander what God wants. He will honor that choice, it grieves him and breaks his heart, but he'll honor that choice, and he gives us that choice. Then we go to Luke verse 14, chapter 15. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the carob pods, the pigs were eating, but no one would give him any. The carob pods are <clears throat> a type of, of plant that were undesirable. They were fit only for hogs to eat. And notice that this guy was in worse shape than the pigs. He was envious of the pigs and what they had to eat. That's how bad a shape he was in. You know, in the Jewish context, this parable is really powerful, as Jesus tells us, because Jesus said that he sent him in the field to feed pigs. Pigs are an unclean animal. It was the ultimate insult for a Jewish person to be exposed to swine. And this guy was reduced to living with pigs and actually being envious of them because they had better things to eat than he did. Now, understand that this is a... a by the way, it reminds me, let me mention, it reminds me of our trip to Peru a few years ago when we went down and took a team from our church and we worked there with one of the Alliance churches in Trujillo who had an outreach to the people who lived in the garbage dump in that city. And it's, it was amazing we discovered that the city has a contract with pig farmers. And pig farmers get first dibs on the dump. The people to whom the church was ministering and we were trying to serve, they could not go through the dump to scavenge for livelihood until the pigs had gotten their fill. Because the people who farmed the pigs paid the government more than the people who scavenged for a living in the dump. That was kind of the situation this guy found himself in. 
But here's the amazing thing about this incident. The boy came and asked for his inheritance. He asked for inheritance prematurely, and he used it for wrong purposes. But what this also teaches us is that once the father gave him the inheritance, that was it. He got all that was going to, he was going to get and all that was coming to him. You see, God will not support us in our sin. We do that on our own. And I want to tell you one of the sad things about many prodigals, many children who run today in our culture, is they choose to squander their inheritance, and they choose to turn their back on Christ, and choose to turn their back on their parents, and their hearts desire for them for God's best, but the parents aren't strong enough to let them go. And they send them a check every month. I'm going to tell you something. If the father had sent this boy a check every month, he would have never been to, he would have never eaten with the pigs, and he would have never come to his senses. God loves us too much to support us in our sin. If you're going to sin, if you're going to run from God, you've got to do that on your own. God's not going to help you in it. You see, living on our own is living a graceless life. Grace is God doing for us, in us, and through us what we're powerless to do on our own. So you see, to live a life with Christ is to live a life by grace. That means that God's power enables us to serve Him. Grace does not give us the power to sin. Grace gives us the power to resist sin and to trust God and follow Him. You see, if we're going to sin, we do it our own, on our own. And this particular incident demonstrates that in the life of this young man. The father gave him inher the inheritance, but once he had spent it, he didn't continue to support him. Why? Because he loved him. And love does what's best for the beloved. A lack of a discipline as children is hatred. The Bible says that God disciplines those he loves, and discipline is painful for the moment. <laughs> but it produces a fruit of holiness in those who are trained by it. So that's who God is. And this father wisely let him reap the fruit of his decisions. And he was eating with the pigs. Well, what was the result? I love this line in verse 17. When he came to his senses. I love that line. When he came to his senses. At some point, because he had sunk so low that the pigs were eating better than him, God finally got his attention. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, and here I am dying of hunger? I'll get up, go to my father, and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to his father. This is a beautiful picture of what it means to come to Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful picture of what it means to turn our life over to Christ. First of all, he came to his senses. He came to his senses when his life was obviously out of control. You see, when he realized he couldn't do it on his own. He had done it his own way. God let him make that choice, but guess where he ended up? In a pigsty. I'm going to tell you something. If you or anybody else, if you try to live your life your way, according to your own wisdom, let me tell you where you're going to end up. In a pigsty or worse. And especially if somebody is praying for us. Because God loves us too much to let us get away with it. Especially if somebody is praying for us. Secondly, what he models for us here is what the Bible means by repentance and confession. Look what he says. He's honest with himself. 
He came to his senses. Wait a minute, this is crazy. Even the servants at my father's house have it so much better than me. I'm going to go to my father and I'm going to say, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. That's great theology. Jesus nails it for us. Every sin, even against someone else, if we break God's law in somebody else's life, we've broken God's law with God. Every sin is against God and any other object of sin. You see, when those people planted those bombs last week in Boston and blew up those folks, they didn't just sin against the people they blew up. They sinned against God. God was offended by that. That was a breaking of God's law. You see, what he did, he was courageous enough to get honest, to get honest about himself before God. And unless you come to your senses and have the courage to recognize the truth about ourselves and about God, we'll never have the life of Jesus. You see, what he recognized was that he deserved to be punished. And until we come to that recognition, we never truly come to Christ. And I love, I love what's built into this when he says, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to his father. Why did he go to his father? Because all of a sudden, in the midst of his conviction, there was hope that life could be better. I want to tell you something. When the Holy Spirit brings conviction to a person... There is brokenness, there's grief, there's remorse, but it's coupled with hope for change. Things will be better. I'll never forget when the Holy Spirit convicted me of my need for Jesus is that I was sad for my sin, but I was glad for Jesus and the change He would bring. I knew that as I trusted Him, that he had something better for me than I could do on my own. And the same is true for you. The true conviction of the Holy Spirit brings a brokenness and a grief for thumbing our nose at God and hurting God and those around us, but it brings a corresponding hope. Forgiveness is available. Change is on the way. I can have a new life. I can start over with Christ. And notice he would have settled to be a servant. He recognized he had used up all his rights as a son when he got his inheritance. He had used up all of his inheritance. I'll just hire on as a servant. Well, the rest of the story, let me read it again. But while the son was still off a long way, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. The son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Wow, that's true confession. You see, to confess does not mean to admit. I, see, so many times, well, yeah, you know, I'm a sinner just like everybody else. Ha, ha, ha. Well, that's nothing to laugh about. That's your death sentence. That's not confession. That is if it even is that, admission. Confession in the Bible is the English rendering of the Greek word homologeo. It's a compound word. Homo is the prefix meaning one or the same. Legeo is the word speak, and it means to say the same thing. What it essentially means is this. To confess sin to God means to agree with God about our sin. It's to say about us and about our sin what God says about us. And this young man, I'm no longer worthy. I've been sinned against heaven and against you. You see, that's exactly what God thought about it. And he agreed with God. And when you get the courage to get there, you see, what we do, we live... Every time we're blaming somebody else, 
We're not there. Well, you know, so-and-so did so-and-so. It's not, so-and-so's not the issue. We're the issue. Look in the mirror. And have the courage to be honest before God. And then you'll see the power of God released in your life, and you'll see change. But the father told his slaves, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Then bring out the fattened calf and slaughter it, and let's celebrate with the feast, because this son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. As he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants and asked what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him, but he replied to his father, Look, I've been slaving many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Son, he said to him, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He's lost and he's found. You see, the heart of the parable, the heart of the parable is the contrast between the father and the brother's reaction. You see, that speaks back to the emphasis that began the need for the parable, and that was the religious leaders and their criticism of Jesus for being excited about lost people coming home and finding God. The heart of the parable was the contrast between the father and the brother's reaction. So let's look at those reactions and see how they apply to our lives. First of all, the Father's joy is a picture of God's desire to forgive and restore. I don't know about you, but I think that's good news. This man had thumbed his nose at his father. He had disappointed his father, but his father was there waiting for him to return. You see, the title of this series within our series in the year of prayer is Father, forgive them. That's, that's Jesus. Those are Jesus' words from the cross. That, that indicates the desire of God to forgive and restore. As we come to the same place where this prodigal son was in total honesty about ourselves, and we despise ourselves in our sin, he's ready to forgive. So the Father's joy is a picture of God's desire to forgive and restore, and that's his attitude toward us. Furthermore, the father's gaze. You remember how the father saw him afar off? How would he see him afar off? He had to be looking for him. I want to tell you that the father's, the father's gaze is a picture of you praying for prodigals around you. You see, that's a picture of our heart and our ache for the people around us who are far from God, and we never give up. We continue to pray. We continue to trust that they would come to their senses and that their sin would have its result in their life. They would reap the consequence justly for their sin and they too would come to their senses. The Father's gaze is a picture of you praying for prodigals around you. Hey, did we get any answers to prayer this morning? We do? Okay, well, let's have them. Let's have them. There we go. Um, God has opened up several opportunities to have a relationship building conversations with our neighbors who don't know Jesus. Isn't that exciting? That's, somebody, that's one, of you, one of you that are praying a lighthouse prayer, and you're praying for the folks around you, and you've had unexpected opportunities to have conversations. That's God just opening doors naturally. As you begin to pray, start to see what God does in your life, your attitude, and the lives of the people around you. Start seeing what God will do. Full approval for Medicaid funding for a mother going into a nursing home. 
Amen. Any others? Okay, God has provided friends for our children who are new to this area. Absolutely. Praise God for relationships. You see, nothing is so insignificant that we don't pray about it. Listen, I've prayed for parking places before. Hey, God, God can find you a parking place. Thankful for God's wisdom and leading and decision involving job challenge. Amen. God leads. My husband got a job making great money. Hallelujah. How many of you know that's an answer to prayer? Amen. Isn't that exciting? Thankful for God's grace in my life and keeping me out of that deep, dark pit that would be so easy to stay in. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hey, let's give God thanks. Amen. That's answered prayer. Listen, prayer is not just talking to the walls. When we come to the Father through Jesus, we enter the throne room of God who's ruling the universe, and God delights to hear our prayers that He might work. And I want to tell you, that Father's gaze is a picture of God waiting, waiting for His children to come home. And as we pray, we join Him at the window, peering out at the road as we join with Him. Now, the brother's resentment is a picture of, I believe, we could say church people who have forgotten who they were. <laughs> church people who have forgotten who they were. You know, Paul was redeemed. He became a new creature in Christ, new creation. He became one who no longer lived, but Christ lived in him. He became a man of God, but he even ever forgot who he was and where he came from. <coughs> because he wrote Timothy and said, I'm, I'm the chief of sinners. Look at all the stuff I did. I've never forgotten how God redeemed me. You know, so many times believers have been in church for many, many years, and we forget who we used to be. Furthermore, and here's the amazing thing, as we look around us, and sadly we see the people that maybe we've known all our life who didn't decide to trust Christ, and we see what a mess they are. And we see what we could have been were it not for Christ, because we are no different than they. And we forget where we came from. So where are you in this story? Whose part do you play? God's agenda was to never forget about the son who left home. And our job is to never stop praying for them to come home. This is a powerful, powerful story of what it means to be redeemed and have your life turned around and changed and what God's attitude is toward that. And I know this morning there may be some of you who are prodigals who have wandered. You need to come home. You need to know that God the Father is there waiting. He, he's, he's on tiptoe looking out the window waiting for you. But you also need to know that there are many of us, as you've heard this story this morning, your heart is broken because of prodigals in your life. Well, I, I want to tell you, what do you think God thinks about them? What do we see in this story that teaches us how God feels about them? I think you've got somebody on your side that can do something about it. So our job is to never stop praying for them to come home. Father, I pray this morning that if there are those here who have strayed, that they'll come home to Jesus today. And they'll realize before it's too late. I, I, I pray they're not having to be envious of the pigs because they're eating better. But Lord, if, if that's what it takes, do whatever it takes. But Lord, help them to have the wisdom to come home now before it's too late. Father, I pray that 
those whose hearts are aching because they're thinking of prodigals who have squandered their inheritance. People who have lived and prayed and followed Jesus and yet have had children who have decided to go another way. Encourage their heart with your heart this morning. And may they make a commitment to never stop looking out the window with you on their knees for them to come home. In Jesus' name, amen.